I guess, I guess the first thing that I was thinking was, I'm just a guy who digs music, and every time that you know there's now music in my inbox, I'm just totally pumped and hoping that I'm finding the next Nirvana or whatever, right? <laughs> and I'm thinking, why, why so long? I mean, it, it feels longer than it should have been. Does it feel that way to you? Absolutely. Yeah. Way too long. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad it took that long mm. because we got what we needed out yeah. of the process. Um, but business, stupid music business. Yeah. It's like we changed labels, we changed managers, everything. Every time you make a change like that, it seems like a year just ticks off the calendar. So, Yeah. Can I ask you about changing that stuff? Sure. Like, is this something you guys initiated or something that was happened to you? Or how does that work? Because, I mean, in a way, I mean, we're just people trying to get along, right? There are people at the label, there are people at management, there are people in a band, and yeah. we're all trying to get along and, and also make a little money and make some music, and yeah. maybe not necessarily in that order. We felt very fortunate to sign to Warner Brothers, and it was basically Dan and Dave from Disturbed that took us under their wing, put mm -hmm. us on their imprint. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, when we signed, I was like, I wonder if we'll do one record, two, ten, you know, like, I don't know. In this day and age, things change so much. Right. It's a great story from, um, you know, we were halfway through making our record, and the entire Warner Brothers staff changed, president all the way down. So all the people that signed us were now gone, yeah. and the new president came in, Rob Cavallo, producer Rob Cavallo, Green Day and other oh, things. Oh, sure, yeah. Big name. And the story, I wasn't there, but the story goes like this, that uh, the whole staff that was left were listening to all the baby bands on the label and all day long they were throwing the CDs in the garbage and then they got to ours and he's, he jumped up and said, now that's what I'm talking about. Mm. So we got saved from that little moment of we could have been just dropped before Vices and Virtues ever came out. Right. Um, and he was integral in getting Dan Donegan to co-produce half of the record because he thought it needed a little more grit mm -hmm. than what we were doing. So that experience was amazing and you know we toured vices and virtues for a couple years two and a half years i think and then uh it was around christmas time my manager called and said uh well we're not doing another record with warner brothers i was like well not surprised was the first thing out of my mouth mm. um loved them loved the process loved how much uh you know to be honest they sunk a lot of dough into that record and i loved it i was like we were kind of living that silly LA dream from mm -hmm. the 80s and 90s of like, okay. Like, I, I remember getting to LA that day to go make the record, and they had rented um, a uh, Suburban for us, which I think we drove like twice. <laughs> and the bill for the Suburban for the time we were in LA was like $12,000. Yeah. And, and I look at indie bands that are struggling to make a record for $12,000, right. like we did. Right, struggle right, right. to make our records for that much and there was that moment where i was like this doesn't make any sense we should go buy a winter beater as we call them in canada a yep. little piece of crap car and then we should flip it when we're done making the record and we'll be in the yeah, at least we'll break even and not and then i had this moment of like and i hate to admit it but i had this moment of like you know what screw it screw it this yeah. is a major label this is the way they want to do things yeah. they want to pay big bucks to do things let's just enjoy ourselves uh -huh. so that's what we did on that record uh. this record uh-uh <laughs> opposite <laughs> sleeping on the floor knocking over empty cans to get up and start the day and make another day you know another day in hell i call that mm. making this record so it's a very so, different process so is that why you write best won't do i mean almost you have to keep pushing on through all this all this <laughs> yeah whatever all this means Funny, uh, Best Won't Do was a direct punch at producer David Bendeth from, mm. from me to him. Fuck you, David. That mm. was me saying, and but he he was pushing us so hard. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I, I'd never been pushed this hard in my life. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to answer to you except that yeah, there's nothing. Nothing right. is going to be good enough. Mm -hmm. Ever, mm -hmm. I mean, I walked into that album day one with about fifty songs that I was Stoked. blood, sweat, tears, right. proud of. Took two years to write them all, you know. Yeah. Uh, 
just so happy. Like took the the best of the best and the worst of the worst. And yeah, brought it all there, and I think four of those fifty got considered for the record, and maybe one of them, two of them, might have been on the record now. Mm. So mm. very difficult process, but loved it. I mean, David Bendeth is now. Uh, a huge ally, a huge believer. Mm -hmm. You know, he helped remind, he helped us remind ourselves who we, of who we are musically. So did he say you do your best, you're just going to wind up typical? Whatever that best was? Because I love that line because it's really... <laughs> no, nah, that was all me. I was, was just, okay. I was just angry and... Because uh... that's what we're all afraid of. We're all afraid we're going to end up typical. Exactly. And then all of a sudden we're not going to make, make something of... It, whatever it is. One of my favorite quotes, Lester Bangs from uh, Almost Famous, when he's talking to uh, a, a, the writer, and he says, oh, don't worry about them. You'll see them all again on their long journey back to the middle. All right. <laughs> right? Truth. Typical. It's true. We all, we all go back to the middle. But, um, yeah, I was just so fired up, and I really felt like nothing would, would work. And uh, now, looking back, isn't it interesting that on Vices and Virtues, we had one of my favorite songs was I'm um, Doing the Best I Can. Mm -hmm, right. And then the first track on the new record is Your Best Won't Do. It was very, right. uh, I'm getting goosebumps just thinking right. about it because it was just very like, this is the answer to that record. Right. You know, easy record, hard record. Mm -hmm. Doing the best I can, that's good enough. Mm -hmm. Your best won't do, not good enough. It was very much that cycle. So trying to take control, I think, with, uh, with the second track, Rise Up? Rise Up was the last <clears throat> song that I wrote before leaving Vancouver mm. to go make the record. Mm. I'm really proud that that one made it, made the cut. Uh, it was probably out of the 15 songs we were considering. I think it was number 12, 13. was not high up the list at all. Mm. Uh, Jeff, our drummer, wrote the guitar riff and sent me the guitar riff. I started jamming it out in Vancouver and really got into the, the, the you know, chug a lug active just yeah. awesome head bobbing feeling mm -hmm. started working on the verses and then i finished it at my piano uh lyrically i was just i knew that the challenge ahead was going to be a, a big one so i just started uh uh looking at my own life and thinking you know we got to rise up here this is we're kind of again facing all odds again you know so it was very much a, a message to myself and the band just we got to go do this knock it out of the park yeah, and and that's I, that's why I love songs like that because I think we all get sick of our situation or our circumstances and whether we have the ability to take take our life back, as you say, right? Yeah, man. And touring America as a Canadian, um, not that Canada's all that, but touring America, uh, so many stories of people that connect with our music that are down and out. But they are finding some light at the end of the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And then I took a lot of that road experience home, you know, just rolling into gas stations and truck stops and meeting people. And, and uh, I think America has the ability to take, take their lives back mm -hmm. and, and not be victimized. And that's kind of where I was going on that. It was just uh, there's so much negative yeah. propaganda out there, too, man, just like... You know, we all get into the Breaking Bad shows and the right. Dexters and all this stuff that you, you get hooked on because it's so cool and it, the acting is so great. But then you sit back and look at the message and yeah. you're like, whoa, I'm being sucked down into this pit. Yeah, right. I need to rise up and, and take my life back. Right. Well, I love the words in the next track where, you know, the, the, the words that we ask ourselves is what's the meaning? Where does it end? All that kind of stuff. It, it, I mean, what a great song to follow that up with and follow that thought up with yeah yeah tear down the wall uh came really naturally it was just like a a beautiful idea of um finding the strength inside to get past the things that hold you back you know it's mm -hmm. I, I never set out to write songs like this. No, but... <laughs> I'd never sit down and say, okay, how can I motivate somebody or myself to... And then, damn it, every time it's like, nothing's going to change till I break these chains and tear down the wall. It's, it, it, we all have the wall, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, right. The proverbial wall. Everyone thinks it's walls, too. I, I get so mad because everyone puts a, a, 
yeah. an S on the end all the time. I guess I don't know why, but I'm. I think there's one wall in everyone's life that we all need to get past, over, under, through somehow. Yeah, and what sucks for me sometimes, I think, is I get past over, under, right? And then all of a sudden, here's that wall again. And I'm like, wait a minute, dude, I, I mean, God, whatever, I've already taken care of the wall. And somehow I allowed it to re-enter, or I, maybe I... Maybe I slid a little bit backwards. I'm, you know, three steps forward, two steps back. I don't exactly. know. Exactly. I'm pretty sure the wall's always there, and yeah. we just have to figure out ways to trick the wall and, right. you know, see how far we can get past it. Uh, there's a weird line that I want to ask you about in Eat, Eat You Alive, because the song's got to be about revenge or some kind of... But dance with a demon so I'm not alone. <laughs> and I just think that it's so... I'm not... I'm, I'm rarely in that place. I can get lonely and dark and bitter and a little cynical but I guess I always think there's hope and there's my wife and there's people around me that remind me that darkness I don't that I don't have to I guess put my arm around it you know and I thought that was really interesting because I'm afraid I'm afraid too many people can cave in to that yeah. darkness and then Th that song yeah. was really uh, about a, a, a guy who was in jail unjustly in a the worst prison cell you could imagine in some foreign country and mm -hmm. uh, it, it was just that feeling and how that relates to your life and we try to be together and we are together this is a the whole life experience is a together thing yeah but at the end of the day we are kind of alone so yeah um, right yeah I think being alone for me is very difficult I don't like being alone I don't I, it's I, I like people. I like conversational. Like right, fun. right, right. And to be alone sucks. So, uh, um, but I'm I'm st I'm changing that. I'm I'm getting through that wall. I'm mm -hmm. like this tour, especially. I've had some moments where I've just been alone and trying to be alone, and it's okay. But definitely, I have some demons that I dance with when I'm alone, and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all do. I think. Yeah. Um. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I think. I don't think you're in any type of a, uh, in my opinion, I don't think you're in any type of a uh, concept record, but I think each song sort of dovetails into the last one before, right? Because sick, I mean, when you're sick of life, dead men walking, but somehow you know, somehow I think you, that you're meant for more, right? Yeah, I've always felt the, the courage and strength that my parents instilled in me to, um, to go out there and uh, let people know that it's okay, let people know that you're going to have the worst day of your life and it's it's going to be the worst day of your life and it'll only get better from there and you have the best day of your life and let's celebrate together you mm -hmm. know on that day so and all the other stuff is just in between those moments and i think it's very comforting to know at least for me that uh that we're all struggling through this crappy existence yeah. and beautiful existence but yeah. it's never just it's never just brown you know it's it's there's violet there's uh yellow right. and it's all in between and and i think you know suicide really bothers me because that, to me that's just like no don't no like you've you have a friend you have a we're all feeling these mm -hmm. horrible thoughts and let's find a way together to get mm -hmm. to get by mm. Even though some things never change, and that is me scatting and segueing and dovetailing it in there, right? <laughs> but I think that's something about somebody who's struggling, and maybe it's about helping him, helping that person. I don't, yeah. Strange man, uh, that was written mostly by Kale. You know, it's not a secret that Adam uh, is a very Adam, emotional guy. And Adam Ganshay from Three Days Grace. Yeah, is who we're talking about. Yeah, yeah Adam's uh, emotional. And, and beautiful person and mm -hmm. so so very talented but his talent um, really comes from struggle and darkness I think a lot of the time mm -hmm. as a listener I mean I, I love Adam's voice I love Three Days Grace I love his new project Saint Asonia and uh, he always seems to find this beautiful place in the darkness mm -hmm. and, and that's what I love about him so I know he was going through a rough couple of years and Kale, being his cousin, uh, except more like brothers, their yeah. their parents they're, are 
two sisters and two okay. brothers married each other. Okay. Oh, wow. That's good. Yeah. Cool. So they're, they call them brusins over in Ontario there. <laughs> brusins. So uh, those two are extremely close. And, you know, if our fans see Adam and Kale, and I'm sure Three Days Grace and St. Sonia fans see Kale and Adam. And right, they're right. just completely they're kind of intertwined and I, I, he struggled with that i love that line that he wrote then that i can always tell when you're upside down because that's really knowing somebody isn't it you know when maybe the always. rest of us can't exactly yeah, yeah, that is yeah sweet. he he riffed on that uh and brought that to us and he's like yeah this is about my relationship with adam and it's just coming out really really well and we all gravitated to it and nice i, I finished it with him and it was just I love that song. It's got a, you know what's poetic about that song too is those guys are all from Norwood, Ontario, mm -hmm. which their family is so musical and so cool. Uh, they they have you know backyard parties and dances and everyone plays an instrument and it's like you, you know what you're picturing in your head the mop bucket bass <laughs> and the and that song to me is a washboard song. It's wow. totally okay. Nice. When you're upside down, the upside in, thinking about what might have been, there's nothing left to say. Nice. So cool. So it's a tribute to that family, the Gantiers, for sure. Sweet. I, didn't, I just have a big question mark beside the song Everything, but I just love the line, I hit the street so I can clear my head. God, I mean, that's just what I've done. You know, I mean, I've done that. Just, you know, I have to go out for a walk. I have to go out for a run, a bike. You know, I mean, something to... That's, that's my thing, totally. It's yeah. uh, when I have had too much in that heated moment, mm -hmm. I just need to walk out. And, yeah. and clear my head yeah. and that's you know Vancouver's been that place for me where I you know I'm literally under the neon red that's the next line mm. I'm, I'm walking down that street grappling with the uh, whatever just happened yeah. That, yeah such a great song we wrote that song backstage in 2008 <laughs> when we were opening for Disturbed and I have uh, recordings on my phone on the on the, uh, oh, nice. on the app or whatever yeah um of us writing the song with Disturbed on the main stage, still, you oh. can hear it in the background. You can hear, you know, like a... Right. <laughs> and we're writing everything in the back. It just flowed out. Yeah. You know, it was such a beautiful moment. Um, I, I dig the thought of, you know, space. The space between us is so relative, isn't it? I mean, when we're on an airplane or whether we're on a bus or whatever or we're in an argument totally right or we're just you and me talking right here or just strangers right i mean sometimes it's like we 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 all kind of should know what the space should be and in this song right intense it's a very cool song uh i'm channeling some some of my inner trent Reznor on that song like <laughs> i just love nine inch nails right. the fragile especially that double record yeah so important to me i i Wandered around the streets of Toronto, mm -hmm. listening, cranking that in my headphones, and just oh. probably my first trip to Toronto by myself. And such amazing city, and I'm definitely uh, channeling some Trent there, and and hopefully doing a good, you know, hopefully doing them justice. But yeah. I, I think you're right. The space is uh, it's a great concept because it really is us beings out here, and the space between us is very awkward and very beautiful right. sometimes. I know, so. and we need it. Yeah. We need that space, and sometimes you. So I mean, for the most part, we we try to respect it, but every once in a while, you need to say it out loud, hey, dude. Space. Yeah, and I love how it came together with it rips us apart, it keeps us together. Right. Yeah. <laughs> That's I love that too, dude. I loved it too. Uh, raging. So track nine, feeling stuck and needing some change. I, I fake it every day, lost in the crowd. I, I have this idea if, if, that there's internal virtual bleeding. Ooh. You yeah. know, I mean, something inside of us, we can't make it, so we got to fake it. That's so funny that you say that, because one of the songs I brought in for the record was called Bleeding on the Inside. Wow, really? Yeah. I want to hear that demo. Yeah, I love it. I'll show it to you. It's a great song. The, I love the whole concept that I think we are bleeding on the inside a lot. And internal bleeding actually freaks me out big time. Like, oh, yeah, right, right. I don't have many fears, but to, to be bleeding on the inside and... Uh, not know like right. at least when you're bleeding on the outside you can freak out you can look right. at it and go right. oh god i gotta go to the right. emergency right. right now right so yeah raging is all uh it's about that 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 little flame and that just keeps burning and you know i think it's about acceptance and um 
there's some there's some De Niro uh, taxi driver going on in that song <laughs> for sure. And I often picture myself 16 walking down the hallway at school. Mm. Be it, we used to have this thing in my school called the gauntlet where it was the older kids would sit on this bench and everyone would have to walk by that bench every day. It was like uh. this long hall and they would just wail on people as they went by. And I'm just like, oh man, I'm gonna, I gotta run the gauntlet. It's like, I don't know, are they gonna throw me into the wall again today? And uh, that's that feeling of raging, just building up inside. And, you know, I don't think there's a day I grew up in Alberta where I didn't hear, get a fucking haircut. <laughs> Like it's not easy. Now I go back and everyone's cool. They're like, oh, you, you're in a band. That's so awesome. But but you're right though. Isn't it funny how we, you're going to think about that your whole life, man? I, I interview a lot of older people, yeah. and they think about stuff 70 years later that happened oh. in high school. It's crazy, but it is. I mean, it's so it's so uh, ingrained in us. Sticks you know, it's, with you. Yeah. And it's like for part of me, I want to be I want to be the guy on the bench in the gauntlet. You know. The yeah. other part of me is going. That's no way to treat people. Yeah. You know, it's but yeah. It's amazing how, you know, you learn a lot of who you are in the first, well, maybe in the womb, but yeah, maybe right. in the first six months of your life right, too. Right. And then the stuff that happens to you growing up in school really sticks with you. Yeah, I keep thinking about Ricky Bobby and uh, in that Will Ferrell movie. But at the at the end, you have uh, I keep burying my skeletons. It's like stuff it on down. Just keep stuffing it down, man. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah, I love that line too. Keep yeah, burying my skeletons. Um, uh, just for me about the world in my head, right? The world's getting worse and somehow you got to stand up for what's right, what rightness is or something. Yeah, you know, uh, I wrote that with a friend who uh, was really into Ed Snowden. Mm, yeah, right. And that whole conspiracy that went down when he had to go to Russia yeah. and, and he, he's still leaking right. out secrets, right, right? At this time of recording, yeah. And it's um, that whole... I'm really interested in that whole... Yeah secrets and and Illuminati us being watched sort of and thing out there right well and just technology too like right. mm -hmm. you know you, you look at when when ed snowden is speaking i think it's a ted talk where he's speaking about his experience and from a little robot in russia or whatever mm -hmm. you can see on his laptop that he's reading from that he has a piece of tape over the camera on the top if you if you stop okay. it and zoom in there's a piece of tape over the camera on your laptop and ever since that moment I've thought every time I open my laptop the camera lights not on right but who is watching right. through and right. I'm not paranoid but right who's listening right who's watching who's keywording right. all of these conversations because yeah. we all know that you know you say the wrong thing enough times into your phone you're going on a, a, a high priority watch list because that's how we fight terrorism. Right, yeah, right. So people are listening. Yeah. And you're you are being watched and it's an interesting time in our lives to uh to oh, I argue with people about this all the time because it's just like, well, yeah. if you don't do anything wrong, why should you care who's watching? Right. I'm like, well, freedom. Yeah. And by the <laughs> way, I genuinely don't care who's watching because I I I mean I don't really want you, you know, streaming my showers, you know, and I don't think anybody <laughs> wants me to stream my showers, right? But I am just saying, it's like, you're right, I really don't care, but but there's the other side of me that goes, still, I don't think we should be watching people. There's a celebrity That's story, and I don't know who the celebrity is, but there's a stalker who got into that Ed Snowden back-end world, Matrix world, yeah. and had enough money to pay someone to get that camera working on her favorite singer's laptop. Oh, really? And got to see him in his hotel room doing his Whatever he's everyday doing. stuff. Right, yeah. And let's face it, we're all masturbating in front of those computers. <laughs> yeah, let's just face that. Well, the thing is, did you see the HBO doc with Ed Snowden? No. Oh, you should watch it. I, I can't wait. get a chance. Yeah, yeah. It, it, pieces of it may be online. But he's, he's talking, you know, he's in the hotel room, and he's like, I'm just saying that there, this hotel phone that's hardwired in, yeah. If they want to, without us knowing it, they can just be listening through that phone. Of course. And it I just went... Makes so much sense. Again, brilliance and, uh, and genius, and all of a sudden it's used for maybe not the better goodness of us. Yeah. You know? And, and where those lines, man, they're so gray. They're so blurred. It's like... Yeah. I'm, I'm all for, you know, keeping things safe, but yeah. then 
I don't know. There's some sci-fi is great because sci-fi deals with this all the time. That's the trick. That's the trick is blurring the lines. Yeah. So we don't know. And like me, don't care, right? Yeah. But maybe I should care more. But really, I mean, it, I don't. I, I personally don't care either. You know, like yeah. go ahead, watch yeah, right. me. But no. But then I, I'm, right. I'm fifty-fifty. I'm like, no, don't, do, don't watch me. <laughs> Privacy, especially in America. You know, like, wow, we just there's something about being able to get in your car mm-hmm. and drive down the highway and no one knows where you are pay for cash with something and there's there's a sense of maybe I'm old school when it comes to that but it, there's a sense of freedom there that just it's, feels good it's funny because you like you talked earlier about not wanting to be alone pretty much right you're a people person all this kind of stuff as am I but there's still a little dream inside of me about going off the grid yeah you know about what's that Gene Hackman movie right. in the nineties? Uh, yeah, going something. off the grid with Will Will Smith. It's great. Yeah, and also Into the Wild movie. If you've seen oh. that movie, yeah, I mean, yeah. with the Eddie Vedder soundtrack. Yeah, oh, God. oh, is that soundtrack crushing? Phenomenal? Crushing, which is uh, the hit off that uh, big big Hot Sun. Yeah, big, big Hot Sun. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. is uh, a Canadian band. It's a cover. Oh, that's a cover song. It's a cover of a Canadian band. I don't oh. know the band, but I love. I and I'm not. I'm not an acoustic guitar guy either. I'm not even a huge Pearl Jam guy. And I love that soundtrack. So good. I'm a huge Pearl Jam guy. Yeah. Early right. Pearl Jam. Oh. Well, I was out. I was in charge of one of the two in stores they ever did, and they did it in East Lansing, Michigan. They were so afraid nobody would show up. We had basketball hoops, Hilarious. and I, we had probably 250 uh, Mookie Blaylock shirts, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, and they were such cool guys. They would just come from the Milwaukee the night before, and they were all wearing uh, Milwaukee Bucks uniforms. And I mean, they just got all the <laughs> swag from Milwaukee Bucks, and they were just, they're just good guys, right? And yeah. You know, and I just, the way they've blown up and the way they're so genuine and, uh, yeah, I dig them. Great band. Speaking of genuine, I, this is what genuinely hit me right in the center of my chest. Uh, if I think too far down the road, I won't make it through the night. Deep down inside, deep down inside, I know at the end there's a light, so I'll just keep holding on. I love, I love that line out of the whole record for me on the song. Cool, In man. the song, One Day at a Time. Yeah, that's an important song for us. It's uh, probably lyrically just the most bare naked honest thing mm-hmm. you know the candle candlelight vigil trying to get it get through one more night one more day of your life and yeah. it's uh you know the words just there's no coded words in there it's just right got to get through yeah and and just keeping hope alive i mean i don't know what it what it how people keep hope alive but even if it's this song even if it's the first sentence next to you even if it's just the sun coming up in the morning I don't even care. I hope it's the song for people, right? You know, that's the great thing about the human spirit yeah. is it seems it can't be crushed. It seems to me that earthquake, Nepal, right, can't be crushed. You know, we're going to lose a few. 9-11, tower goes down. Yeah. We lost a lot of few. A right. lot of few. Well, yeah. I know what you mean. Yep. Uh, we won't be crushed. We will not stop. We will keep going mm-hmm. and we will... You know, maybe it's like the bees and the ants and, and, and just the crazy insects that never stop. Right. Maybe we're just a, an ant colony that will never stop no matter what. We'll carry that leaf as far as we need to. Right. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm always fascinated by the human spirit and how rugged it is. Then, then I'm going to go back to Moth to a Flame for, for conversation purposes, sure. but then I'm going to jump to the last song, which is Ubuntu. Do I say that right? Yeah. Awesome. But that is thoughts of death, isn't it? Realizing your mortality and some oh, yeah. really interesting thoughts to end a record. To leave us thinking, I guess, right? We were going to call the record Ubuntu. Um, we decided not to at the last minute because uh, it was so obscure and I, I just we wanted to make sure people understood what was yeah. going on. Um, my parents went on a trip to Africa and it's an African word much like... Uh, Shalom or, or uh, Amen or what? Yeah. But it directly or, or um, the direct translation is I am because you are. You are because I am. Oh yeah, you can say that in the right. yeah. And I just I, I just my dad told me about that and I just loved the meaning and it, it kind of says what I think I'm trying to say in all these songs is that we're mm. all connected. Mm-hmm. And um, my dad was re-diagnosed with cancer while we made the record so i got a phone call last may that he had an incurable cancer and 
that's it. Got mm-hmm. the call. So I shed many, many tears. Yeah, and, dude. and I was uh, really heartbroken. And Ubuntu fittingly became my my way of dealing with that phone call and not being able to go home. And I'm, I mean, I could have just said, screw this, we're not doing the record now, I'm going, mm-hmm. going home. Mm-hmm. But we, it was such a deep, dark time, and that just added to the depths of the struggle. And so it just came out, and I was totally thinking about... It, it's poetry now to me because, you know, Get Through This, I wrote 10 years ago when my dad was right, di- yeah, originally talking diagnosed. About that. So he had a, a great 10-year run, you know, of beating cancer and we had so many celebrations during that time yeah and then uh with ubuntu it just we all knew there was no light at the end of that tunnel right but but of course there is you know what i mean yeah yeah of course there is i hope there is just yeah just a different different light so right so thanks for go back to moth go you know the only thing i was gonna say about moth moth to the flame was i i just think it's there's two different type of people that get too close to the flame. And I think people like you and me want to get there because we're trying to figure out what it is. And I think other people don't realize what it is. Curiosity killed the cat, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. But uh, it also enlightens and, and empowers us and all that kind of stuff. It's funny how that song uh, has become the most popular song on our tour. Oh, really? So never considered a single, never considered even, it, I think it's a bonus track on the record. And now I'm playing it on the road. It's our crew and our our the band and every night a lot of fans say wow that moth song is blowing our minds Mm. and uh david bendeth actually started writing that for me in the studio because of what he was witnessing the moths that we five were when we came in there Mm. and four when we left and the flame he, he he told me literally one day he we would struggle out in the uh, main tracking room all day long writing songs and he'd just sit in his office and at the end of the day call me in and say uh, working on an idea I'm like oh cool what's, what's, what's that all about he's like it's called Moth to a Flame I'm like what's it about he's like it's about you <laughs> and I'm like ha 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 and he's like no <laughs> this is about you Right. and we worked on it together and it just turned into what it is a brilliant brilliant tune dude here's what i am gonna say thanks for the time i appreciate it every time man yeah me too man i always enjoy this right it's on really important thanks